the Hamilton service and today I'll be your presenter. As you were introduced to the concept of this unit, you will realize that we have a mixture of both psychiatric and medical patients. We are going to be proceeding on a group of lectures that will take into consideration the psychiatric diagnosis, the medical diagnosis, and then we will put them together to see how one impacts the other. Today, as we begin our lectures, we'll begin with the psychotic disorders and primarily we'll focus on schizophrenia. For today's lecture, I'm going to ask that we write our questions down and at the end of my presentation, there will be a segment that we will focus on question and answers. Today, we will also focus on two primary things. We will be using the PowerPoint presentation. We will augment that with the handouts that were given to you for your um, review. And we will also review the case analysis that you have been working on. So what are we going to be accomplishing today? Our objectives today will focus on defining schizophrenia. We will outline the epidemiology of schizophrenia. We will identify the etiological patterns affect, um, associated with schizophrenia. We will list the types of schizophrenia and we will identify principles in terms of management after we have looked at the signs and symptoms. So let's begin. What is schizophrenia? By way of introduction, I would like to present to you some statistics that were distributed by the World Health Organization. Schizophrenia is considered a chronic disorder. The course of this disorder goes through three primary stages. One, there's a prodromal stage, there's the active phase, and there is the residual phase. The prodromal and the residual phase are primarily those two stages wherein there is minimal amount of the signs and symptoms that will define schizophrenia. By that, we will find that an individual may be going through what we call magical thinking, there will be some degree of self-care deficit, and there will be some degree of relational issues that is already impaired by the onset of this illness. The active phase, phase will define for us the hallmark of schizophrenia wherein you will have the full-blown signs and symptoms that will be used for its diagnosis. World Health Organization also tells us that 2.4 million Americans are living with schizophrenia. And how does that impact us? When we look at the epidemiology, we will go into a little bit more as to the clearer picture as it presents in our world. Definition of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is defined as a psychotic disorder, a psychotic disorder which is characterized by positive and negative symptoms. By positive symptoms, we're speaking about those attributes of the illness that are externalizing. The individual may become agitated, they're experiencing hallucinatory and delusional experiences. The thought process becomes altered and manifested by thought form disorder, word salad, neologism, and thought blocking. There may also be the movement disorder associated with the positive symptoms. By negative symptoms, we're speaking to a disruption particularly in the normal emotions that are exhibited by an individual. For some persons looking on, it may be mistaken for symptoms of depression, but when we evaluate some of the diagnostic features, we realize that these symptoms are progressing over a year and also are characterized by fixed falls perceptions of reality and hallucinatory experiences. In negative symptoms, we may find that the emotions in terms of our presentation, an individual may not be able to smile or hold a smile given a situation wherein a smile may be important. Or they may have what we call a blunted affect, meaning that the facial expressions are emotionless. We're not able to read into what they're actually experiencing. So as we look at epidemiology, we realize that schizophrenia affects 1 to 1.5% 1 of the population. The male to female ratio is equal. However, according to the diagnostic statistics, it is saying to us 
that it commonly occurs between the ages of 15 to 35 years old, but it does occur earlier in terms of onset for males rather than female. But when it gets to the period of the defining age group of 15 to 35, we find that both male and female are at equal ratio. There was something that was also interesting in the data as I looked up. It said that children who were born to mothers who were diagnosed during the flu season of having flu symptoms or born in the winter months are at an increased risk for developing schizophrenia. When we look at that, we can appreciate that the winter months are usually those that um, persons are going through lonesome period, there's not much interaction, because persons are usually in their homes at that time, but we realize that it does affect the level of socialization, and if socialization is impacted, then interaction with the outside environment becomes impaired. So what are our causes for schizophrenia? We are defined again that the cause of schizophrenia is unknown. However, there are some defining characteristics that we will look at. And these would include the biological factors, genetical factors, and the socioeconomic factors. So by biological factors, we will look primarily on the neuroanatomical and neurochemical issues. And according to the definition put to us, any insult or injury to the brain that results in a physical impairment of brain tissue or increase or decrease of cerebrospinal fluid increases the risk for the development of schizophrenia. The dopamine theory is all, or neurochemical theory emphasizes certain neurochemicals that are important for normal functioning in terms of or normal behavior, affect, and mood. So it is said that an increase of dopamine in the limbic system also increases the risk for schizophrenia and will be manifested in more of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, whereas a decrease of dopamine in the frontal brain results in schizophrenia with the manifestations of more of our negative symptoms. For genetics, it is said by the Diagnostic and Statistical Institute again that consanguinity is an important factor in the developmental stages of schizophrenia, wherein we see that there's increased occurrences in family lineage. There is an increase percentage of schizophrenia where the parent is also diagnosed with schizophrenia. By that I mean if a parent is diagnosed with schizophrenia, that's one parent, then it increases the likelihood for the child by 10 to 15 percent for being diagnosed with schizophrenia. If both parents are however diagnosed with schizophrenia, then it increases the likelihood to a 35 to 40 percent. There is also an increase tendency where it concerns twins. The statistics tells us that 50% of all identical twins, if one is diagnosed, then the likelihood increases that the other will be diagnosed with schizophrenia as well. When we look at etiological factors, the psychosocial and environmental environment plays a great role in the development of our moods or interaction or socialization. And if there is any impairment in terms of our development, this will result in an individual's increased chances for being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So what are some of these factors? Our psychosocial environment entails our family. When we're born, we first come to our family lineage and the socialization and bonding that is received within the household is very important. We see if there is poor mother-to-child relationship or there is any disturbed family interpersonal relationship, it increases the likelihood for the disorder to be diagnosed in an individual. If there are rigid concepts of reality, if there is impaired sexual identity and body image, there is the increased risk for schizophrenia. What I found very interesting is the double bind theory that 
poses um, as an etiological factor. It stated that if there is conflict between how a child is raised moving from parent to parent in light of separation, if there is no, if there is strict, if there is strict um, discipline measures on one hand and there is none on the other, then it increases the likelihood for schizophrenia. And then we look at the personal factors. If my self-esteem is impacted, if I am not in control of who I am and where I am, if my confidence is impacted, then it gives rise to the presence of schizophrenia. So what are the types of schizophrenia that we will look at? There are five primary types of schizophrenia. There's a paranoid, disorganized, catatonic, undifferentiated, and the residual type of schizophrenia. The name defines what happens during each stage of schizophrenia. So for paranoid schizophrenia, we will see that there is an increased presentation of delusions, hallucinatory experiences, hostile, aggressive, or violent argumentative behavior, Disorganized type is characterized mostly by regression to primitive levels of functioning. So a 35 year old will go back to the primitive functioning of like a 15 year old, wherein there is silly affect, there is inappropriation of speech and behavior patterns, and there may be presentations of hallucinations and delusions. The catatonic type is predominantly characterized by disturbance in motor function, be, be exaggerated movements or decreased movements. There may be stupor, withdrawal, rigidity, negativism, or there may be excitement and there is constant moving or pacing and, abil and, and inability to remain still. The undifferentiated type shows a mixture of symptoms but cannot be classified in any particular category. Residual state of an partial remission wherein there is symptoms but they are not so profound to impair activities of daily living. You can also go back to the handouts because the different types will be classified more on the handout and you are able to ask questions from that as they come up. When we look at signs and symptoms, the signs and symptoms that we are particularly interested in are those that impair the general overall functioning of an individual. It may present in overall decline in terms of achievement of expected levels. At 15, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be leaving middle school, going into high school, forming bonds, having intimate relationships with my peers. If that is impacted, then that's a sign that something may be happening. Form, form of thought, there may be derailing, loosening of association, neologism, blocking, or there may be incoherence where I'm speaking, but what I'm saying has no particular trend, thought, or focus and cannot be followed meaningfully. This points to an impaired impairment in terms of myself, who I am, where I am, and how I function. If I'm not able to control that, it may lead to two things. Either negative symptoms where I become withdrawn or positive symptoms I become aggressive and I am externalizing my symptoms. The management of schizophrenia can be summarized into broad concepts and just for a minute I'll focus your attention to the concepts that we're looking at. Safety is our primary goal. Team approach and then our focus for management is to return the individual to social and occupational functioning in keeping with their age and developmental stages. How do we do that? Through pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy. In areas where there is still alternative therapy, those are used to augment the management system. And it cannot be overemphasized that we educate our patients, our family, their social systems. Because if we're able to help them to appreciate what is happening, how and what is causing the behaviors that they're manifesting, then it will increase their likelihood for them to become compliant with treatment protocols and to return to a level of social and occupation functioning that was once established. We want to establish therapeutic relationships with our patients, improve communication, and implement interventions that will help them to cope and to see where they are and to be able to return to those level of functioning. So by way of summary, 
today what we focus on is a broad concept or definition of schizophrenia. What is it? How does it present itself to us? What forms? What are the types? What causes it? If we're able to find to appreciate the cause, then we're able to apply different management prototypes that will address our causative factors. Whereas schizophrenia cannot be cured, the management and treatment is geared towards suppressing or reducing the signs and symptoms and the impact on the individual's lifestyle and the patterns of socialization. If we're able to do that, then we are able to help the individual to return to the highest possible level of social and occupational functioning. At this point in time, are there any questions?